Hey, so I'm here at Wild Hope Farm in Chester, South Carolina, and I am pumped to be here for an awesome workshop, and this is just a super cool farm, and you guys are doing some really cool stuff, so thanks so much for having me, first of all, and I want to introduce you to Sean and Peanut, and if you guys can introduce yourselves and just, you know, see a little bit about the farm and what to expect in the workshop today. Yeah, my name is Sean Yadnicek, and I manage the farm here, and I'm going to be talking about some of our no-till techniques and farm design, and take you all on a tour of the farm and show you all the exciting stuff that we're doing here at Wild Hope Farm. I'm Peanut, or Catherine Belk, um, and I do a little bit of everything, mostly administrative, marketing, you know, also field work, truck driving, whatever. Um, and I'll give you guys an overview on how the farm got started, tell our story, um, and here to answer any questions that y'all might have. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited, and uh, I'll leave a link down for contact information and social media and stuff for you guys. So if you guys are in the area or you want to follow them, I'll, I'll make sure you guys can see that. Check us out. So as a background, um, my parents bought the land over 20 years ago, uh, more as a place to get away for the weekend. They lived in Charlotte, um, it was this old dairy, it was actually 400 acres, so it's this part of the property as well as, you know, on the other side of the fence, y'all might have seen that barn over there, um, that side of the property. So when it got divided in half, my dad and his brother bought it together, um, and his brother decided to move to Colorado and um, was trying to sell his property, so they divided the property in half. So that's why we got kind of a narrow strip right here up front and then it, it goes further back that way. So we're on 220 acres um, and right now we're working with about 12 acres that we um, have probably six that's actively in production um, and six that we're cultivating and prepping for um, putting into production next year. It's been super dry here, it hasn't rained in two months now. Our last rain was July 31st. So um, yeah, it's been hard. Uh, Definitely since we rely on rainfall for all of our cover crops, so um, we're, we're starting to irrigate our cover crops. <laughs> so I got a new sprinkler system for that that I'm borrowing from a neighbor to try out. But uh, this is our produce wash and pack shed, and um, one thing I've realized in farming is that you spend most of your time harvesting produce and packing it and getting it to market. So um, when we uh, started this farm, I we, spent a lot of time designing and redesigning um, that part of the farm to make it as efficient as possible. We're still redesigning as, as we go. Um, so to make it more efficient, I've realized that you know you can spend a lot of labor and time just like carrying one bin by hand like we did at the last farm that I worked at. Or you could use a pallet jack, I don't know where a pallet jack is right there, <laughs> and uh, move you know 30 bins or 40 bins at a time with a pallet jack and it's very easy to do it with a pallet jack as opposed to carrying it by hand. So I um, kind of designed this whole uh, process around uh, palletization. So we've got like a loading dock for the trailer now, we put that in last winter. All these coolers are designed to, um, for the pallets, so we've got five foot doors in the middle of the cooler and I've realized that the cooler is 12 feet deep and 14 feet wide inside dimensions, then that's the perfect size. You can fit three pallets down both sides, and then if you need to, you can put pallets down the walkway in the middle. If it's 15 feet wide, it makes it a little easier to get the pallets in and out of there. So that seems to be like a really good dimension um, for the smallest size you want to go, I think, for, for pallets in your cooler. But uh, so our produce will come in usually uh, via trailer, um, and we have a pull-through system so we can pull the trailer all, all the way through if we need to. And then it's pretty much at the same height as our um, offload table right here. We also use this table for washing uh, bunch greens. So you can put all your bunch greens on here. We've got a um, high pressure nozzle, which is up there right now to keep it out of the way uh, for our, our tour today. But um, you can cr it's, on, it's on demand and it's electric, so you can crank that down um, and to reduce the pressure on it, it makes it really easy to wash the dirt off the, off the bunch roots. Um, really like that and it also makes it nice to like hose down this area and clean it up. Floor drain, floor drain uh, empties to a ditch outside. You don't have to connect your floor drains or your produce wash drains to um, a septic system because you just overload your septic system. So you can have all that go to a ditch outside. You just have to watch your chlorine levels. So produce will come off the trailer on here and then um, gets hydro cooled and cleaned in these uh, tanks 
So I really like these stock tank uh, conversions. Um, but if you do these conversions, uh, I think it's key to put the drain on one end so that it's easy to wash all the debris to that drain. The first sink I built, I put the drain in the middle and it took forever to get all the, the debris to that. So you put your drain on one end and then you kind of slope it slightly towards that drain. It makes it really easy to clean these out. Hudson flow valve. Um, so as it fills up, uh, it stops when it gets full, so you don't have to worry about turning it off and it overflowing. I think it's key to like fill your sinks up with uh, you know at least a one inch line so you can quickly fill those up. You don't have to you know. And these Hudson float valves facilitate that too. There's other types of float valves, but they don't fill as fast as the Hudson float valve. So I think that's really helpful. Um, and then having a dedicated uh, hose for like cleaning your sink out is nice too. And then the roller conveyors. So once the idea is once the produce comes off the field, you don't have to like carry a bin around anymore. You can use roller conveyors to, to move those around. And then just not having to like lift the bin up onto a scale is helpful as well. You can just roll onto the roller uh, conveyor scale. So it saves, you know, lifting I don't know, however many bins you harvest in a day, having to lift all those one more time onto the scale. Um, so all those little things, you know, save your back and, and hopefully make uh, your harvest manager happy. <laughs> And then for our microgreens, we use those um, uh, nylon mesh bags that are just uh, for sports equipment. And then you can put those in a bin, harvest your greens into that, and then you can easily get your greens out of the bin, dump them, um, or dump them in the bin, and then uh, put them into that salad spinner there. So it just makes it easy to move your, your greens around um, when you have them in those nylon mesh bags. And then some of our round root crops and cantaloupes and winter squash and things like that. You use a brush washer. Uh, you just hook a hose up to it and uh, run things through that. So you can clean a lot of ends of produce pretty quickly. Uh, saves a lot of time. This year I set up a little dedicated area for all our harvest tools, which I think is good. It's like if it has a place that it should go back to, then it will get put back as opposed to just kind of scattered about. So that's been really nice. And I think uh, spring-loaded hose reels are really nice, um, especially if you're if you're moving to a pallet-based system. So you don't want hoses all over the ground. Um, so it's easy to just get your hose in and out. Um, we're getting ready to install another uh, spring-loaded hose reel for that high-pressure hose that'll be up on the ceiling. Because otherwise, you've got this hose all coiled around the ground. And there's a lot of stuff going on over here. We've got um, you know timer for the irrigation system, and you can get timers now that. Uh, connect to uh, your cell phones. So if you have wireless, so you can control your timer from your um, cell phone, which is pretty sweet. And then um, whole farm filter, fertigation system, there's a little diaphragm pump right here that's connected to a 55 gallon drum outside. So you can um, put fertilizer in that, dilute it, and then inject that into your drip system. Backflow prevention device, uh, so you don't contaminate your water uh, from your irrigation system. And this over here is a uh, hydronic heating system. So it's a, a recirculating system that we use to extract heat out of the compost pile. And then I'll show you all more of that later. And then um, it's just connected up to this uh, hot water heater for backup heat, which I actually haven't needed to use the hot water heater yet. Just got involved from compost. And then um, an egg wash machine. That comes from a guy uh, actually near uh, Ridgeland, near Bluffton. So close to you guys. Um, He's a rocket scientist that does farming and invented and built an egg washing machine. Pretty cool guy. We'll talk more about our bin washing system, um, but we this is our clean pallet of bins that we pack into, and we have separate bins for what we pack into for members, and then what we harvest into, and they're different colors and different sizes, so that's good. Um, and then essentially. Like Sean was saying, it's just much easier to have everything be palletized. So this bay means that I can just pull out three pallets of what we're packing for the day, set them up, and then we'll have sort of usually three people, and every person's doing like four items, and just the bins start here. We'll add as we go, and it's easy. You can just set out three or four bins, grab four bunches, put those in, move it on to the next person go around this way and then we'll have a finishing pallet so everything gets loaded and then wrapped and then can go straight to the trailer. I must say their bin pack rate is insane. It's like over before it starts usually. I'm like, y'all are already <laughs> finished? So it's crazy how fast it goes. And then oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, when we had this as the pack area, we designed these sinks so you could take decouple the sinks with a union coupler and then move, move the sinks out of the way. 
We use the pallet jack to move them out of the way, but I think it would be, if you did do that, which we don't do anymore, it's much better to just put wheels on the bottom of your tub, and then you can have a removable sink, um, so you could use these, roll, say, use roller conveyors for other things as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, people get the code and then it'll unlock. Um, and then, you know, they can let themselves into the trailer. I kind of, I put a little stepping uh, stool right here. They can walk in. Everything's on the pallet system and pre-packed for you. Um, so you come in and unload one bin's worth into your reusable grocery bags. Um, if you have ed eggs as an add-on, you pick up your eggs. Um, leave the bin here and then carry on. And I've got a video of this on our website and on um, YouTube as well if y'all are interested in seeing what that looks like in action. So it's pretty streamlined. Um, you know, one challenge that we've kind of realized is that, you know, the, the uh, bigger window during which uh, people can pick up is super convenient for the customer, but can be a little bit inconvenient if you're not, if you don't have something to do in that in-between time. So since my husband works in Charlotte, I do the uh, deliveries to Charlotte, I drop it off, and then I spend the night in Charlotte and drive back the next day. Um, but if you don't have someone like that that could be a little bit more flexible, um, it, it might not work for you. But this is awesome. You know, We rarely have any issues um, with people coming to pick up their stuff. Um, and we also take it to a farmer's market as well. And if anyone wants to look, you can see we opened the back doors, but we have the little loading ramp so that, like we said before, everything's palletized, so we just load the ramp in. You don't have to touch the bins more than once. And it's always in refrigeration, so um, it's higher quality produce. Um, we also wrap our, our uh, stacks, our pallets, um, in plastic so that it can stay a little bit more humid in there. Um, and customers we, self serve from the farmers market too, so we'll be selling at the farmers market and they go in at the farmers market. And we'll yeah, we definitely can do more sales at the farmers market. We can offer that CSA, which makes our farmers market that much more profitable because we have to be there anyways. So, and there's no line for this customers, they can just come in, they can even get there early um, at this farmers market at Matthews that we do. You can't uh, start selling until the bell rings, but our CSA members can just come, get their stuff, go on, be done with their day. The, this greenhouse is passive solar heated and also compost heated, so all these barrels are filled with water. And then in the daytime, they, they, the water absorbs the heat, it's called thermal mass. And then at nighttime, it re-radiates the heat. So just having these barrels in here uh, is equivalent of burning about 2.4 gallons of propane every night and the amount of heat that it captures and releases. And then um, some of the barrels on that side there are connected to our compost heat extraction system and they've got about 50 feet of pipe coiled inside of them. And then uh, the water inside those pipes heats up from the compost and then um, transfers that heat into the barrels. So you can kind of charge those barrels with heat um, from the compost pile and then that heat re-radiates into the greenhouse. And then um, just automated misters for irrigation. The half fans here recirculate the air so uh, you don't get any condensation on the plants, which helps with uh, disease problems in your, in your starts. You want to talk, yeah, about three steps? Yeah, so it's a, a four-stage cooling system uh, and takes advantage of convection as much as possible. So the first stage just opens that vent up top and then all the heat uh, rises out of the greenhouse. And then the second stage opens those vents on that side. So you get that cross ventilation and the predominant winds and, uh, come from that direction too, so they help push the air through. And then um, the third stage uh, closes that vent and turns the fan on, and then that pulls more air through faster, so you get a uh, more cooling effect. And then when the whole system's off at night, that's when the half fans come on and recirculate the air. So it's just uh, all controlled with um, simple like temperature relays that are connected to that board up there. Uh, yeah, and coming from a farm who didn't have these like automated systems, I would say it definitely saves a lot of time. So not thinking about, oh, did I open the prop house? Is it going to be cool enough for what's in there? And is, did the water come on? Does this? It's just like we don't even really have to think about it. You do come check on it, but automated saves a lot of time. Yeah, every time I've done something that isn't automated, I kill it. So <laughs> I just got to have to automate. <laughs> not diligent enough. All right, and then uh, some other things that are helpful, I think, uh, like for a lot of plants, a lot of our flats will use vacuum, use vacuum seeder here, which is helpful. Show you all that. You get like pelletized seed for lettuce, and you can use vacuum seeder for that. 
dibble clay for uh, making depressions in your flats. Do you want to talk about the speedling flats? I feel like yeah, those are your favorites, right? Yeah, these are really awesome. Like these speedling flats, and there's some research that was done in Florida. And these were some other transplants flat flats, and the transplants from these perform the best. One of the benefits of these is they fit. Uh, these cells or the plants, um, the cell blocks fit really well in our mechanical transplanter. Uh, so this kind of like have to have these flats for the mechanical transplanter, I believe. But they're styrofoam. Why would you get them? <laughs> <laughs> they they aren't as durable as some of the plastic ones, especially the uh, wind strip flats. So they do break and UV degrades the styrofoam as well. But another benefit of them is that if you if the root balls are filled out really well and it's the right moisture, you can actually pull the transplants out from the top. So you don't, which is important when you're mechanically transplanting because you've got to like pull them out as quickly as possible because that's your limiting factor. Uh, is how fast you can pull them out, is how fast you can plant them. So not having to like pop them out from the bottom when you're doing that is, is speeds things up considerably. At our most efficient rate, how many transplants do you say we can do in like an hour? I don't know, 2,000. And the mechanical transplanter company says you can go up to 6,000. So um, we got some improving today. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I don't know if we'll ever get there, but. <laughs> um, so we do uh, like we get we, uh, compost that comes from the city of Chester that's made from leaves, and that makes up 50% of our mix, and it's just like a cheap kind of filler. And then we do 25% peat moss that so we add to that, and then 25% perlite. And the perlite's important because it aerates the mix mixture, so you don't have to worry about overwatering. Because when you have automated systems, you're kind of watering to the plants that need it the most, and then that means you're going to be overwatering a lot of things. Um, I, um, good question. I think vermiculite does similar, except vermiculite holds moisture to you. So I usually cover the seeds with vermiculite. Um, That's what's in that trash can behind it. Yeah, and then that way the seeds can push through the vermiculite. It's a little lighter, so you don't have to worry about burying them too deep. A lot of times you need the vermiculite. And then it holds moisture, so it keeps the seeds wet. But um, I think perlite, I don't, know, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I feel like perlite may, might hold more air than vermiculite. It may not be true or not. I could just be imagining things, <laughs> which I do a lot of, so don't quote me on it. All right, and then uh, we don't really use um, fish emulsion or liquid fertilizers. We, I just use this uh, flour sifter here, and then we top dress, like this Nature Safe 566. And we also put some of that in our potting soil mix. So, yeah, just so fish emulsion is so stinky, I don't like to use it, but um, plants might do better. I was thinking about maybe injecting it with our fertigation system. And, which ain't good looking. All right, what size is this right now? It's 30 by 45. And I calculated for our flat size and our CSA productions is big enough to do about 12 acres of transplants for. And then we also, we're gonna go outside, yeah, look at the shade house. house. So all our stuff starts here in the spring. And then of course, when it gets hot, we take things outside. Mm -hmm. Start them under the shade and then we can harden them off in there too uh, in the spring without the shade cloth on it. Our pest control comes from attracting beneficials, and one way we do that is with the, our um, rainwater harvesting pond over here. So we keep fish out of it, and that means that more frogs and toads can grow in there, and you get a larger diversity of the frogs and toads. And without fish, you get the frogs and toads that disperse into the landscape. So you get everywhere you walk around the farm, especially when there's vegetation out here, every you know five feet or so, you'll run into a frog or a toad. And then each of those eats, you know, two to I mean, three hundred insects a day. So you just have this army of pest control agents that are constantly going out into the environment to control those pests for you. And then you get dragonflies. So I've noticed a massive reduction in our pest population every time I build these um, frog and toad ponds. So it's just a super easy, simple, long-term solution to, to pests is just to build a, a, a small pond. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, what else we have out here? So this field normally would have cover crop growing in it. Um, prior to it being bare, we just had a cover crop of cowpeas. Um, cowpeas are a nitrogen fixer. Um, 
And we grew the cowpeas to fertilize the ryegrass and crimson clover that we just planted in here. Uh, it's important if you're gonna, this area will be no-tilled next year, and it's important if you no-till that you provide your, your uh, cereal rye with enough fertility. Adding that in as a fertilizer is super expensive, so it's much cheaper to just grow the cowpeas that they can generate about $600 in fertilizer per acre cowpeas that you grow. And if anybody's interested in seeing what a lot of these fields look like in cover crop, um, we took a bunch of videos. It's nowhere near, you know, the quality of some of our YouTubers over here. But we took a bunch of videos and talked about some of these things and put it on YouTube so you can see an example of, you know, what it would look like at a, at a time when, you know, we actually have something in the field. So this field here just quickly had, um, it was, part of it was, uh, it was no-tilled last year and then this year in the spring the so no-till last year but then um, after the no-till it had back into Ryan clover yeah ba no uh, actually had cow peas in it um, after the no-till and then the cow peas winter killed and then that was our early spring crops went into here I always like to plant early spring crops into a winter killed cover crop of cow peas because um, with your early spring crops, you don't want any fresh organic matter out in the field because that's going to attract uh, maggots, cabbage maggots, which will eat your transplants, eat your seeds. So I always like to plant my early stuff into a winter killed cover crop. That way the cover crop is there before it gets cold, the cold kills it, and then you have that residue on the surface. You don't have any erosion, you have that soil protection, but then it all decomposes and by the time spring comes, there's not a lot of residue there. You can just take one pass with your, with your cultivation equipment. A lot of times you don't even have to do any tillage. Here was a uh, no-till this year. And um, so this is the remaining of the no-till. There's not a lot left. But uh, so we have peppers, eggplant, green onions, uh, and sweet potatoes. This is the only thing left in, the, in that no-till patch. But the peppers and eggplants, um, those have such a long growing season. When you do the no-till with the rye, you get about six weeks of weed control with just the rye grass as your mulch. And then the rye grass starts breaking down and you get weeds starting to grow through it. So the, uh, the peppers and the eggplant are in there for you know six months. So we need more weed control for that. So after we crimp it, um, we'll add a layer of mulch. Um, this year we did wood chips, last year we did leaves. Leaves are much better than wood chips, but we didn't, um, we had, the wood chips are free, the leaves cost us money. So we went with wood chips this year. <laughs> But you just add a small layer of wood chips to the top of that. Um, I like to crimp it and then let it kind of dry out for about a week. Because if you put the wood chips or the leaves on right after you crimp and the cover crop is still green, it tends to uh, decompose the cover crop really quickly. But you let it dry out and get a little more cellulosic and then add that layer to it. And then um, it, the cover, uh, cover crop underneath the wood chips won't, or the leaves won't decompose so quickly. And you get the six months of weed control. So we've probably spent, I don't know how many, hours weeding this patch this year what do y'all think oh hours i don't even know if i minutes. count an hour <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been like hardly any weeding at all yeah um and we put these in and like uh eight into april of uh, may yeah. actually yeah, yeah may. like however many yeah. months no weeding yeah if anyone also so what's left of got crimped over there where that little lone bunch of scallions is that's what it would look like after it was crimped before there was mulch added mm -hmm. And then this had some mulch residue in it too. And we used to, I used to not grow green onions in the summertime. I have a slide on this in the presentation, but the, the uh, rye mulch, when you grow it in the no-till, it, it tends to, um, I guess the predatory mites in that mulch prevent the thrip damage. So I used to just get eaten up with thrips with all of our green onions. But once we, we started doing them in the no-till, um, you don't really get any thrip damage anymore. So we've converted all of our scallions over to the no-till when we have the ability to do that yeah so that's really helpful as well when you harvest like in you know you're going to harvest zucchini in a tilled area and then the no-till area you can tell that in the no-till area that habitat of mulch is just like there's so much activity going on there that really i feel like i feel like just from pure observation that reduction in pests in a no-till area for sure yeah less cucumber beetles less thrips less uh, like, leaf-footed bugs. It's really kind of amazing how how you get that reduction. Yeah. The other thing, well, we'll talk about it all in the presentation, but um, what we noticed in the spring too is that with the spread of disease, like soil splash essentially, when we, were, we planted some stuff into tilled and then it rained, 
splashed up on those cucurbits started to spread disease, but no-till is beautiful, obviously, because it really does reduce that. And you could, you could see that in the spring, no-till till there. But when you do peppers into the no-till, <clears throat> like a lot of people don't do them. Do peppers in no-till, like counterpart at Clemson didn't like to do it, the guy who took my place, because you get a lot of stem rot at the plant. So it's key after you plant your peppers to pull the mulch back away from the plants. You don't want the mulch like contacting the stems. That's the only thing I see that with is with the pepper plants. Get it away from there and then you won't get that stem rot. I don't know what the disease is called, but some disease that gets in there through the stem, I guess, and you get that moisture up against the stem. So, but it's easy to, to remedy that when you transplant. So we start on this end usually and we leave a space over here and each so you can flip them after you've done water on one side. And we rinse them off in a bleach solution, 10 to 1, water to bleach. Um, then we stack them all on the wall. And I guess four highs as high as we ever go. Um, and we found that flipping them, alternating them front to back, just they stack better. Um, so bleach, then pressure wash everything, flip them, bleach again, pressure wash everything. And then we usually just let them dry a little bit and then we'll bring the pallet jack out, clear onto a pallet. And I have to say that coming from a farm, we didn't have a, like a pressure washing, central pressure washing system, but having that basically, because the same pressure washer runs this and the one that's inside the pack shed, just make sure like, it's so easy to keep things clean when the access to it is easy. And so like, if we use the harvest wagon to transplant and it ends up being dirty or we, you know, whatever it is, you just pull this along, rinse it off with the pressure washer and keep going, so. Yeah, if all the equipment can get it hosed down with this. And the key is, is to use these uh, nozzles that, have, that rotate. So instead of like it spraying out at a 20 degree angle or 15 degree angle, it's a zero degree. So it's just a really high powered point and then it spins around, you can kind of see it. And that really makes it effective because that has the ability to take labels off, that'll blast labels off. If there's any debris or food in here, it just like shreds it and sends it through. So um, having that nozzle, it doesn't really work unless you have that nozzle. Nozzle costs a little more, but um, definitely worth it. Yeah, for sure. And then this past year, we built that little structure back there uh, to shelter the bins. So once we clean the bins, we put them in there um, for the harvesting bins. The ones, the beige bins that are our CSA pack ones, when they're clean, they go in there. We put little signs up so you know whether it's clean or dirty. All right, and then while we're in the shade, I'll point out, um, so over there we've got our compost heat extraction system. So the easiest and simplest way to extract heat from a compost pile is just use those 55 gallon drums and you place them on the outside of your greenhouse and that becomes a wall that protects your greenhouse from the compost pile. Then we basically keep the compost pile over the top and on the sides of those. And you need a pretty big pile to generate heat, probably at least eight feet wide. And that heaps over the top of them. Uh, at Clemson I use wood chips and food waste and mix those together in our manure spreader. Here we just get uh, horse manure and bedding from a local farm and he comes and drops it off. Um, but that whole concrete slab there holds about 90 cubic yards. Um, you could fit about 45 cubic yards would be enough just for the barrel system. So the compost gets up to about 140 degrees for five weeks and then it heats the water in the barrels and the barrels transfer that heat into the greenhouse because the plastic on the greenhouse is actually touching the barrels. So if you don't have compost on them, heating them, then those things are actually gonna be pulling heat out of the greenhouse. But because we have compost on in the winter time, it's generating heat that then heats the water and that water transfers into the greenhouse. And then we'll use a row cover that we can pull over our plants and then basically uh, attach it to that top bar that's on the inside there. So then the heat that's generated from those barrels goes underneath the row cover and the row cover traps the heat from the compost pile and then helps keep that heat lower to where the plants actually need it. So just super cheap, will pay for itself in you know, a month in the amount of heat that it generates. And then the other system that we use, we have about a thousand feet of half inch uh, PEX pipe embedded in the concrete there. That's connected to that closed loop recirculating system that I showed you all in the shed. So that pushes the water through those pipes and the pipes, the water and the pipes absorb the heat from the compost pile. 
through the slab and then um, that heats that water up and then we can just then transfer that, that hot water in where we need it. So that's the more expensive way to do it, but um, it, it allows you to have a compost pile in a remote location. Caro for, you know, primary tillage, mainly do that setting up a field, but I have realized that, you know, after you do the no-till, um, we had it switched to a permanent bed system. We basically just kept our, the same beds all the time. And, you know, when we were done with the crop, or, you know, done with the cover crop, we would mow the cover crop. We're going into the tillage system and then rototill the top of the bed and then take cultivation equipment through to kill any weeds in the furrows or cover crops in the furrows. But with the no-till, if you're going in after a no-till, it, it, it complicates things because you, you can rot rototill the top of the no-till bed to get rid of the residue on the top um, if you're trying to plant another cover crop into it or another crop into it. But then you have all this residue in the furrow that was a little harder to deal with. So I tried converting um, uh, or adapting our, our cultivation toolbar into a high residue cultivator that had coulters that would cut through the residue and then you could cultivate underneath it. But you still had problems with like all the residue kind of dragging through. It was difficult to do. Um, so now after I no-till, I'll usually just till the entire field with the disc harrow. Um, you lose the, the permanent raised bed effect, but it does help with you know weed control and with incorporating that residue. Um, I think if we had higher quality, high residue cultivation system, we could probably do permanent raised beds, but we're not there yet. But it was something that we experimented with. The other problem I, I saw with that was the raised beds would basically shrink over time and it's hard to like get them back up to their their original size unless you do a complete tillage. Um, Did you right, talk about why you do raised beds? Uh, yeah, raised beds are just I think important for drainage and then the raised beds also will give you better cover crop growth. I feel like when I've ever done side-by-side -side comparisons of cover crops on raised beds and cover crops on flat ground, the raised bed cover crops are taller, they mature earlier, I think you get more soil heat because you have those different soil angles, so the soil absorbs more heat from the sun, and then with that increased drainage, the cover crops just always do better, and then of course your, veg your cash crops are always gonna do better on raised beds as well. So um, actually use the crimper on raised beds, and the, you know, uh, they make raised bed crimpers, but I find that they're not necessary. You can just use a normal roller crimper on the raised bed, and the crimper goes on top of the beds, and crimps the grass and then um, the tires basically crimp the furrows and uh, it's been working great. You don't really need the raised bed crimper. But um, right now this is set up for, you know, with the disc running parallel for, for seeding on flat ground. So how often would you disc just once a year? Um, yeah, it depends. Uh, yeah, generally, you know, disking once a year, if that is all you need. You know, some, yeah. If you're not doing, um, after the, the roller crimper, if you're not doing um, no-till, you can basically do the permanent bed system much easier because you don't have all that residue to contend with. Because even when you're done with the crop and the no-till system, there's still a massive amount of residue there. So it's kind of hard. If you have any weeds, if you can keep it perfectly weed-free, then I think you could just, you know, till the top of the raised bed and broadcast some seed over it and not worry about, if you don't have any weeds in the furrow, you won't have to worry about doing any tillage there, cultivation there. And when you have the permanent raised bed system, you don't want to disc because you mess up your beds. Yeah, yeah, it just destroys everything and you're starting over again. So in that situation, use the road tiller on the top. And it's, I don't even know if that's really considered tillage because when I would do that, you know, if I'm doing that, I just go like a few inches deep. So it's not really doing any deep tillage. I like to keep as much organic matter on the surface as possible. You can run into issues too, you know, after you no-till, um, you've got all that residue on the surface, and then if you grow another cover crop, I've, I've planted over that without tilling it in and grown another cover crop, and then um, mow that down and try to, there's just so much residue on the soil surface, it's really hard to like direct seed through that. It's just like, direct seeding into a bale of hay at that point. Right. So, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get in my head, kind of that whole rotation of, yeah. you know, all the cover crops and when you do the tilling and, mm -hmm. you know, how often, it, I mean, it's just... Um, yeah, so in that situation, you know, you can have too much residue on the surface, which can interfere with, you know, your, your direct seeding. Mm -hmm. um, so... 
And yeah. I would say you don't ever really till deeper than two or three inches, right? Yeah, you know, I'm pulling All your out. tillage is shallow tillage. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I was going to add that, you know, if, if you put a little bit of white behind a Johnny's bed right, it's about the same amount of disturbance. Right. You know, yeah. you're basically very heavily raking. Right. So or the same with a tilter. I mean, it's very, very shallow. We're not doing any, like, ripping or anything like that. And when, mm -hmm. when Sean was talking about disking, we're using it primarily just to get started. We're not, like, w once our raised beds are um, formed and, you know, we've got our systems in place, we're not using that. That's kind of what I, how I took it at first, but then, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't real sure how to So when you say, like, one to <laughs> yeah. two times, or, like, maybe okay. one time yeah, a year, and explain and I, that. Well, when I, and I started going in after the no-till crops just to, like, because there's so much residue there. It's hard to deal with that in a permanent bed system, so I, I did this year transition back to using this after the no-till to just get that residue incorporated because it was making it hard. To, I was getting too much residue build up. It's kind of odd because you want residue, but you can get too much residue too. Um, so then if you are doing tillage uh, or you're just trying to incorporate a cover crop, you know, flail mower is really key. Um, it has blades that spin this direction instead of a rotary mower, which spins this direction. The flail mower chops the cover crop residue up much finer, and it leaves it evenly distributed on the surface. Um, so you get the nutrients and the organic matter evenly distributed as well. And then with it chopped up really fine, once you do till it in the ground, you can turn that field over much quicker. Um, so instead of like with the rotary mower, it would leave things in big chunks and it would like make big piles of stuff, nothing's evenly distributed. It might take two weeks to turn a field over. With the flail mower, after you mow the cover crop down, you can turn it over in like a, in a few days, even if you wanted to. So it just speeds everything up. Um, speeds the whole process up. Then once you disc everything in, you mow it, disc it, then you can make a raised bed with the bed shaper. These come in different uh, shapes and forms. Um, we just transitioned from a three inch bed top to, or three foot bed top to a four foot bed top. So we're having to readapt all of our equipment, but having a wider bed means less pathways in the field and more crops we can grow in the field. And then our bed shaper has a drip tape applicator, which can bury the drip tape. If you're doing the no-till, the drip tape just goes on the surface, but we'll use this to put the drip tape out. You just drive over the no-till area and then someone walks behind and, and uses sod staples to hold the drip tape in place. Um, but this will bury it. And if you have the drip tape buried and you're doing tillage operations, it's really nice because um, you don't have to worry about damaging the drip tape on the surface when you do any kind of cultivation. And then also when you're irrigating, the surface of the soil never gets wet. So if the surface of the soil never gets wet and you have a real dry time like we're in right now, the weeds will never germinate on the surface of the soil. So basically really helps with the weeding because the plants are getting the moisture, but the weeds aren't. So it saves a massive amount of time. The one issue with drip is that, you know, you're just wetting this very small area and most of our fertility is coming from cover crops. So if you have your, your if your fertility is coming from cover crops, all the nutrients are all out here and you're only irrigating this very small area. So if you have a drought like we're in right now, your cover crops are getting water, but they're not getting the nutrients. So being able to fertigate, I think, is really key if you're just relying on drip irrigation systems. Hopefully, you know, we'll get a sprinkler system, so if we run into problems, we could just overhead irrigate and get that fertility back without having to fertigate. But right now, we're fertigating to, to give the, the nutrients that are required during droughts. All righty, and then cultivation. We've got uh, this cultivation toolbar over here. So you can use this for stale seed bedding or weeding around plants. Um, the different attachments you can put on it. If you want to get really close to the plant, you can use these. are called uh, beet sweets or beet knives. Um, Doing uh, stale seed bedding, if you don't need to get so close to the plants, you can use S tines. So the S tines will put you know, a bunch of them on here so they completely cover the entire surface of the bed. And then um, you can also use spider wheels. So these will throw soil a little bit. So as your plants are small, your plants are small, you can throw soil away from them. This is really heavy. 
And then as your plants get bigger, um, you can throw soil underneath them to bury the weeds. So if you're doing cultivation, you know, with this stuff and you time everything right and with stale seed bedding and all that, you won't have to do any hoeing. Um, you can just throw soil away and the plants get bigger and throw soil underneath them and do all the weeding with this. Um, but this generally does about 90% of the weeds. And then these are sweeps that go on the furrows between the raised beds and these are called side wings and they rebuild the furrows. If you don't have the side wings and when you cultivate your beds eventually collapse and collapse and collapse and then you lose that, that raised bed and drainage effect. And then these are side knives right there and those will cultivate the sides of the raised beds. So at Clemson, you know, I used to have a cultivation toolbar and I didn't have those side knives so we were missing this little teensy section on the sides of all the beds and then we would spend hours going back with the hoe and getting that little section that we were missing and then literally just spend like $20 on side knives and it saves many hours of labor. <laughs> so good tool to add to that. And then, um, yeah, flame weeder right there. The farmer's friends would be nice. I will recommend when I bought it, it came with a pressure regulator and it didn't, it never worked. And finally I was like, maybe if I take the pressure regulator, regulator off of work and I did that and it works on now. Um, and PTO sprayer for putting out organic pesticides, mainly BT for um, your brassicas. And then a mechanical transplanter. And it doesn't have the no-till attachment on it right now, but this is that filter that cuts through the mulch. And then this is the ripping shank that rips through the soil, which allows you to use the, the mechanical transplanter um, in the no-till situation. And basically, uh, you can put water in this, so it injects a little bit of water as you transplant. This is a carousel that the flats go on, and then you sit on here, the tractor goes that direction, and as fast as you can pull them out and plop them in these things, this thing spins around and it just puts the plant in the ground for you. So it saves a lot of time and back-breaking energy. And then um, this tool over here is a bed lifter. So for harvesting garlic and carrots, um, you can use this blade right here, which goes underneath the crops and lifts them up slightly. It makes them much easier to harvest. And then to make extra use out of this toolbar, we added the um, drip tape auto winder on it. So this, the bed lifter, and that works in conjunction with the bed lifter. The bed lifter goes underneath the drip tape and then this machine basically winds it up into a spool to get it out of the ground. That was one of the worst chores, is just getting the drip tape up. So it's still difficult, but not as difficult. All right, so this is the roller crimper. Uh, it's got a drain plug right here. You open that up and fill it up with water to give you the weight that it needs. It's super heavy. Um, our tractor, our category one tractor can like barely lift this thing to full. Um, but I pretty much fill it all the way up with water situation when the, the dry grass is really lush and green, it was cutting through it, but um, normally you're not going to be crimping at that stage, you're going to be crimping when it's mature in that um, milk stage, and then uh, it won't be cutting through, but if it is cutting through, it's more likely to re-sprout, so you don't want to cut through the grass or the crop, you just want to crimp and pinch the stems, and that's what this dull blade does. But the chevron pattern, basically as it's rolling, the weight's going back and forth like that, so it's... Um, if the blades were, were parallel, it would have this bouncing effect and vibrate the tractor more, so that's, that's helpful. But just a super simple piece of equipment. It's got two grease fittings on either end, and um, they say, you know, it's better to mount it on the front of your tractor, uh, so it's the first thing that hits the cover crops, um, because, you know, you're not going to get as complete kill where the tires, if the tires push it down first. I'm doing everything on raised beds, um, so, you know, this isn't hitting the tire tracks anyways. And I feel like, you know, every now and then you'll get popping back of the cover crop on the shoulders. Um, so I'll usually run through with the roller crimper twice, and if I see it, you know, bouncing back on the shoulder, I'll try to, like, get the tire on that area where it is, where, the, where it didn't crimp good the first time. So I'll, I'll do two passes and the 
second pass, I'll like kind of focus on the areas that I missed the first time. It tends to be working well, and um, you know I'll plant the I'll broadcast the cover crop on the raised bed, and then run the bed shaper back over it and incorporate those seeds. And when I do that, all the cover crop seeds are kind of pushed out of the furrows, so I don't really get good cover crop growth in the furrows. But it doesn't seem to be an issue because that's a low point. So once you crimp all the mulch tends to like move down to that area anyways. You get too much mulch in the furrow and the area where it's weakest is right on the shoulder of that raised bed, that point where it goes down. That's, that tends to be the weak point and that's where you'll get some weed growth usually if it's not thick enough. And they make these in different lengths, right? Different? Yeah, yeah. They make a shorter one, a smaller one? Yeah, uh, just for the walk behind and get a smaller one. But the key is, is I think, is you know, doing your weeding of your no-till before you even plant your cover crop. You know, if you weed it the year ahead of time by doing, you know, making sure nothing's going to seed in your field and stale seed bedding before you plant that cover, that winter cover crop. You know, you're doing all your weeding ahead of time. And then if you've got any bare areas in your cover crop where weeds can come through, there's no weed seed there to germinate. Just one field of six. Yeah, okay. yeah, it goes all the way back there. But um, so you can see the layout. We put the road on the ridge there, and then all these beds slope. Um, and the field is broken up. There's a low point down the middle there, where you can see that T post right in the middle. And um, basically, they slope into a vegetated waterway, so it'll be permanently vegetated with a sod. Uh, so as the water comes off the field, it hits that vegetated waterway, and that vegetated waterway. Um, takes the water to a yeah, lower yeah. point off the field. So it's all about you know managing your drainage and making sure that you're not losing soil. So to, I was talking about reducing the slope length. This one little section here is too steep. So you can see we cut this cross drain in here to kind of reduce the slope length. Yeah, it's right where the sprinkler is there and comes over. Um, just to cut that length in so it kind of reduces a lot of our erosion that we're gonna have over here. But um, yeah, just uh, you know, valve boxes kind of go in the middle of your fields, and then you can have two valves in there, and then and then you can run headers in both directions. That's a little more efficient. And so in this section right here, this is where we were going to do early spring production. Um, so we planted a cowpea cover crop in here about three days after that last rain that we had, and um, the seeds, like about 15% of the seeds, germinated. And then uh, it hasn't rained since. So, without the, uh, the, what the idea was, the cowpeas would grow up, provide a lot of cover and residue to prevent the erosion during the winter time. So we didn't have any cowpea growth, and now we're not going to get a rain until it's too late. So I'm worried that the cowpea seeds would just sit there and then become a weed next year because none of them germ germinate, and they're not going to germinate if it's too cold. They're going to wait until it's warm next year and then germinate, and that's when they're going to be a weed. So abandoned doing early spring crops in here and ended up planting cereal rye and crimson clover. And now I'm trying to get all those cowpea seeds to germinate so that we don't have a weed problem. And then we'll no-till this next year, but I don't want the weed problem with the cowpeas. So we're trying to get those cowpeas to germinate. And then the, the clover and rye will also germinate at the same time. So we'll have a good early cover crop growth here for, for crimping. Do you avoid planting right it's at my 12 o'clock where the, the, the big dip is. Yeah, so that's where it's permanently vegetated. It's a real wide, maybe uh, 
30 foot wide, but it'll be, um, I planted, ideally you want something like Bermuda grass in there that's gonna be able to withstand, you know, traffic and equipment traffic, but then the problem with Bermuda grass is it's just this nightmare constantly creeping into the field, so you have to battle it for the rest of your life. So I'm trying to do um, uh, uh, fescue, which can't tolerate the wear and it's not as drought resistant as a Bermuda grass. So I'm thinking maybe if we can irrigate it, keep it alive and then not drive in that area whenever it's wet so that it won't kill it. Or just try not to drive in there as much as possible and then keep our driving to the main access road down the middle. Um, maybe that'll work, but yeah, you definitely need that area permanently vegetated so it can handle the volume of water that's gonna be coming off the field. And then the other side of the field um, also slopes into a dip. It's not as obvious. And then if it's not very steep um, and you need to get the water out of the field, you can see if you walk out there, you can see I basically um, have an access road that goes down that drainage, but then I ditched it too. So that as those beds drain, um, they'll be able to drain completely off the field without any pooling water. The idea is you don't want anywhere, you don't want, you don't want water to pool anywhere, mm -hmm. so you don't want any low dips in your field. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of pooling water will, will cause plant or cover crop problems. But you don't want it to be steep, you know? That's the key, shallow as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically this field looks like this pasture when, where did, when did you plant the Sudex? Sudex was uh, June, like June. the first, yeah. first or second week in June, we got it in a little late. But if you look, like this field was dissed in, the Sudex was dissed in um, probably two weeks earlier than the rest of the field. And if you go look at the rest of the field, you can still see a lot of that cover crop residue. You can see it coming in from here. Like the, the right side is way lighter. Color. Yeah, it's Much crazy. <laughs> and then the area that we didn't have the cover crop growing in is along that far edge. So if you want to see the color of the soil with the Sudex cover crop mm. and without the Sudex cover crop, if you walk down there, that's when you can really see the drastic difference in the organic matter in the soil um, pre and post cover cropping. But um, yeah, the Sudex cover crop, fences and on, the Sudex cover crop, I mean, that'll be there next year, all that residue. Uh, it, it lasts a long time. That was a massive cover crop. Yeah, it was huge, huge, huge. Lots of material, but it really builds your soil. And there's not a lot, there are some perennial weeds. What's that dog? Dog bane. Bane survived. But um, we got rid of all the blackberries, all the Bermuda grass, all the, um, almost all the weeds. And perennial and annual weeds have been eliminated in this field and also just like the amount of organic matter and nutrients you're putting into your soil too and one thing i didn't mention is you know in order to get that good cover crop growth your ph has to be right you know you need enough phosphorus in there enough potassium in there which we've luckily had all that when we started this field because the person who was taking care of the pasture um, and running his cows through it here was doing all that work for us but if you aren't there with your nutrients you know you need to get your soil tested adjust all that before you put your seed X and your cow peas in. Otherwise your seed X and cow peas aren't gonna thrive and then you're not gonna get the benefits from that cover cross. Yeah. Can't use any chemical fertilizer with organic. Yeah, with organic stuff. But if you are transitioning into organic, what I would recommend doing is using uh, chemical fertilizers. Like if you have been, had chemicals in that field and you're just gonna stop and transition to organic, well before you stop and transition to organic, bring up your phosphorus and bring up your potassium level with cheap conventional fertilizers right. and then transition. Get your cover crop in <laughs> and then start how, there. How long does that transition take? It takes three years. Three years? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So that, that helps. And even if, you know, I mean, getting rid of the weeds with herbicides, you know, would be much easier too. But I, I feel like Sudex and Calpies yeah. do a better job than herbicides do. blueberries we actually cover cropped cow peas this summer and then you planted rye into these uh, aisles yeah. right so that we could potentially do no-till sweet potatoes in between the blueberries next year. This is a field that we opened up this year and it's way we're gonna probably just rely heavily on field trees so I feel like this is not great for annual production having kind of short beds with the tractor and tight turnaround. 
not yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is going to feel horrible. See, the soil isn't as good here. And before, you know, we used to have drainage problems in here. There were a bunch of low areas, especially on this field, until we lowered this side so that these beds would drain properly. You can see all the water kind of splits, comes out here and then flows down. But um, yeah, we just had areas that didn't drain, so the soil stayed wet, and then those areas inevitably got tilled or cultivated when the soil was too wet. And then once you do that, it ruins the soil. So we had a lot of soil damage in here before we could get the drainage done right. That's why it's key to get the drainage done before you start cropping a field. Get all the field grading done um, at that stage as early as you can. This parallel system, this works for the um, it's hit, uh, like we haven't had, we did have the fence, the charger was off and in the spring, summer, and we had deer come in and ate some of the beans. But we haven't had any deer get into this field this, this fall. Yeah. I will say like right here where the fence, where we plug in, there's just like a single line there. I like to pee in that area as like a <laughs> scent barrier. Yeah. Um, deer deterrent. But the double fence does seem to work. I think if it's too close together, like it might be too close together here, probably I think five feet wide is a little better. So I had an amazing time at the workshop today at Wild Hope Farm, just awesome people. I highly recommend you check them out and if you're interested in any consulting services or permaculture design and stuff like that, you know, go check out their website, but make sure you give them a follow on Instagram and uh, you know, really enjoy the time here and you know, getting to know these people and Sean's just an amazing wealth of knowledge and I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.